Hello, hope you're all having a good day. I'm just doing another quick video about some things I've learned that I think you might find interesting. A lot of people talk about the oil, uh, not having the, the you know, the, the oil in the lamps that uh, half the virgins, the foolish virgins don't have. And what what is the oil? A lot of people get, um, well, they have a lot of ideas about it. I won't get into what they are, but the oil is actually revealed in, if you guys hear some strange noises, don't mind me. It's just my dogs. They're both, <laughs> they're both trying to sit on my lap right now. Anyways, um, the oil is uh, revealed in the song, song of Songs, the Song of Solomon, chapter 1, verse 3. And the specific scripture is, Because of the savor of thy good ointments, thy name is as ointment poured forth. Therefore, do the virgins love thee. So, to, to kind of grasp what this is saying, you have to look into the meaning of these words, because ointments does not sound like oil, but when you actually look it up in the Strong's Concordance, you find that ointment is oil. The ointment is the fat or the fatness, the shaman, the oil, the olive oil for anointing. It's defined as liquid as from the olive, the richness, the fruitfulness. Um, the oil that's often perfumed. Remember, Jesus was um, anointed with oils when he was put in the tomb. Um, so, the oil is thy name, which is as ointment, which is the oil poured forth. What does that mean? The name. The name is the position, the reputation, the designation of God, the memorial, the, mem the memory, and the monument of who he is. So the identification of who the Messiah is, who is who is Jesus, who is God who came in the flesh, his testimony and his name, Jesus, which in the Hebrew is Yahushua, Yeshua, however you want to say, it, you know, I'm not I'm not a legalist or I'm not into being all particular about that kind of stuff. What matters is what the name means. The name means God's salvation. God's sa he, he is God's, he's the Savior that God sent. He came here in the flesh to become the perfect sacrifice for sin. Why do we need that? Because sin is terrible. Listen, man, sin is not a good thing. It's, it's, a, it's all, the, all the carnal and fleshy desires. And I'm not saying that you know, being human is a bad thing, but it kind of is. I mean, because it, we're we're, we're kind of ruled by the needs of the of the body and the flesh, which aren't aren't really they're not really focused on the things of the heaven, which which are the higher things, the things that, which involve sacrifice and service and giving and and true love, empathy, compassion, things like that. That's not inherent to our nature. Our nature is inherently. If you looked at a child, a baby, and you wanted to know what the nature of humankind is. Look at a baby. If a baby was big and strong enough to murder its parent to get what it needed to survive, it would. Because that's human nature. Like, children are completely dependent on us. Babies are dependent on us. They require us to take care of them and sustain them. But their, their needs are so incredible. The physical needs and desires, the carnal needs of babies and infants and people and humans, whatever in general, they're so intense that they will step on anything and everything to get themselves fulfilled. I'm kind of going off on a tangent and I apologize for that. So I'm just trying to explain why, because I've struggled with why do we need that sacrifice for sin. It seems kind of morose to me, but because God is righteous. and that, What does that mean? Righteous means that there is justice, a just reward, or a just punishment for all good or bad things. So everything you've ever done in your life, every lie you've told, everything you've ever, like even if you stole a piece of candy or you had an unkind thought, th those are considered sins. And yeah, it's not a big deal to us because we, we live in this world and, um, we don't see that these things are serious, but but if you're dealing with a with a being, an, a deity, a, a perfect, the the perfection of God, which is God, His righteousness, He can't He cannot allow for those things which we feel are minor, but they are 
they have eternal consequences. He can't allow those things to go without retribution. His justness requires um, for there to be a punishment for things that are unjust that we do. No matter how small or insignificant they are, that's why you need Jesus, because he paid that price. You can never pay it. Every sin you've done ever, since it, since you were little, you know, you know, I don't know about the age of accountability and all those things, but, you know, every single sin that you've ever committed, minor, large, rationalized, however you want to think about it, has a price. It has a wage. The wage is death. That's what it is, because you cannot have sin or corruption enter into perfection. Perfection is eternal, okay? You can't take anything dark and um, terrible, a little white lie or any kind of small um, misconduct or anything like that. You cannot take it into eternity, because that would destroy eternity. You can't do that. Only perfection can enter. So, therefore, those things that we've done have to be accounted for. They have to be paid for. We can't pay them because the, the, the one single very first sin we ever did damned us for all eternity. That, that cut us off from the kingdom of heaven. That one sin. So if you're one very first sin, the consequence is eternal for that very first sin, then every sin since then has just added on to it. You can't correct it. There's nothing you can do in this life that's going to fix any of that. You can't do anything good to make up for what you did in the past. Whether or not you think it was a big deal in, in eternity and in perfection, it's a big deal. So, you know, the thing is, is it's not bad news because God is kind and good and perfect and gracious and uh, merciful. So he, therefore, took the punishment. If you want to know what the punishment for sin is, look at what they did to Jesus, okay? What did they do to him? He has been humiliated for over 2,000 years, over and over and over again, by the retelling of what was done to him. Not just what was done to him physically, but what was done to him um, in, in, the, uh, in the spiritual, the denigration, the, the, the psychological things, what they did to him. That is your punishment. That is your punishment. Okay? That is the, that's the penalty. That's the wage of sin. Right there. Everything he went through. He, he took that for you. You got to understand that what he went through is not just some gratuitous, you know, fest of violence. It was the literal punishment for sin. And because of who he is, he was able to take all that and rise. He rose. He, 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 his flesh died, and then he was risen, okay? All right, well, let me get back to the oil, okay? I'm sorry I got off on a tangent. So the oil is the name and testimony of Jesus. The name is his, his designation. So because of the savor of thy good ointments, because of the savor, because of the, what is the savor? The scent, the aroma, the soothing. This, the, which is technical term for the sacrifice to God. This, this, the scent, the aroma of soothing. The aroma of soothing because of the aroma of the soothing of the oil of your name. It's as the oil poured forth. That's, that's the, the richness, the fruitfulness poured forth. Therefore do the virgins love thee. What virgins? Well, the virgins that are in the parable of the ten virgins. The virgins that have the oil, they have the name and testimony of Jesus. What is a testimony? The, the, the testimony of Jesus, the, the spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. Um, that is in Revelation. But it's also found in Isaiah. And the spirit of testimony, it, it, it's the testimony of who he is. Who is he? If you don't know that he is God in the flesh, he was God in the flesh and now he's glorified. If you don't know that, if you think he was just an angel that was sent down, if you think he was a quote-unquote son separate from God, that he wasn't God, that he, he didn't put on flesh, you don't know him, okay? You got to know who he is. If you don't know his identity, you will never understand what he did and, and, and what, what the point of all of it is. And he has to open your eyes to that. I hope that you you ha have that understanding because it's, it's, it's the most wonderful thing in the world to know who your creator is. Like you think you love your parents, but who made your parents? 
The creator made your parents, and your creator made you. He made everything. That's the per he's you're closer to him than any other individual that has ever existed because he created you. To know who created you, is there anything better than that? And you want to deny that? You know that is that. I don't really know how to how, how, why anybody would want to deny that. I mean, God's not some amorphous blob. We're not. You're not an accident. Why would you think so poorly of yourself and of, of the creation itself? But at any rate, um, in Isaiah it says, You are my witnesses and my servant whom I have chosen that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. And then he said in Isaiah 43, 12, I have declared and have saved and have shown when there was no strange God among you, therefore you are my witnesses, saith the Lord God, that I am God. Okay, that is a testimony. You got to know who he is. The savor of thy good ointments is as, as the savor of thy good ointments, the, not, thy name is as the savor of thy good ointments. But well, hold on a second. I'm screwing it up. Not very organized. <laughs> Thy name, because of the savor of thy good ointments, thy name is as ointment poured forth. Therefore, do the virgins lovely, love thee. That is the oil. It's not the Holy Spirit. It's not some feeling that you have. It's not some kind of ridiculous jibber jabber, blathering on and on in nonsensical tongues, which are ridiculous. It's his name and his testimony. Stop living in your flesh if you think that it's anything else besides about him. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's about him. It's about what he did. It's about his identity. And you, if you want to be his witness, you have to know who he is. And that is that is the sealing. Bind up the testimony. Seal the law among my disciples. That's in Isaiah 8.16. Isaiah 8.20. To the law and the testimony. That's the law. The law and the testimony, Okay. The testimony, what is the testimony? The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So that's, it's, it's Elijah and it's Moses on the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus to the law and to the testimony, which is the spirit of prophecy of Jesus. If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. It is also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. So the sealing is to be to have to have the t testimony bind up the testimony and seal the law among my disciples. The, what is the law? The law is the righteousness of God. It's not found in any human except for when Jesus walked the earth, okay? The two witnesses, the law and the prophets. The spirit of prophecy is a testimony of Jesus. For he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel. That's in Psalm 78:5. That is the two witnesses, the law and the testimony. That is what the end time witnesses speak of. The righteousness and salvation that is found only in Jesus. Those two things, those two, those two words, the, the meaning that they carry, they appear together 18 times. They appear together 18 times as a testimony as to what is the what is the witness. Who, what, what is the message of the end time witnesses? Righteousness and salvation are found only in Christ. The Spirit of the Lord shall come upon you and you will prophesy. And then you shall be turned... Okay, hold on a second. I will pour out my Spirit and your sons and daughters will prophesy. Okay, that specific phrase appears fi about five times. In Joel, in, in Zechariah, in Acts twice, and in Revelation. The, the combination of the words spirit and prophecy. It's just all uh, um, reiterated over and over and over again. So, if you, you know, if you want to learn about the, if you want more oil, there's lots of oil. You can have a lot of oil. Just learn the testimony of Jesus. First of all, know who he is and testify to that. Don't ever deny it. And then talk about the prophecy of him and everything from Genesis through Revelation. And I think, well, I mean, there's a lot of examples of prophecy of Jesus in the very first chapter of Genesis. But one of my favorite things is, I think it's in the second second or third chapter of Genesis, is when Adam, okay, Jesus is the second Adam, right? So here's an example of some oil you can just add into your lamp. Adam was put into a deep sleep and then 
God pierced him and took out a rib, and from that he created Eve. Well, that's a that's a prophecy of Jesus because Jesus was pierced. Okay, he was pierced on the cross, and out of him flowed blood and water. That is how we were birthed. We were birthed through his his death. Through through he he has given us salvation in that way. So Jesus being the second Adam the blood and water pouring forth from him, birthing out the new creation, which is us. And that is prophesied in in that in the creation of Eve, which is the bride of Christ, which is, well, you know, a prophecy of the bride of Christ, which is us. So, I mean, there's a lot, a lot of other stuff I, li I like, to, like to go into. I really didn't think this was going to be that long. I wasn't planning on it, and I didn't mean to go off in so many different directions. But I thought that that was very important to know about the oil. And also, it's to get an idea about, and I'm still learning. I, I haven't got a full grasp of the, 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 um, the law and the prophets, the uh, salvation and righteousness. Those two things that appear together 18 times in Scripture, um, how how they are manifested or explained. But they are witnesses to the. That's the witness. There's no other witness. Nobody else can testify that they have righteousness and salvation. Only in Jesus. So. You know, hopefully that helped, and I'm not too not not confusing you too much. And if you have any questions, just leave a message or leave a little comment, and um, I will try to address that later. And I love you guys all. I hope this was interesting for you. Um, I love learning, so I'm I'm interested in what you have to say too. Okay, much love. Take care. Bye bye.